Sports Hernia Part 1. Hello, my name is Dr. Greg Mancini. I'm Associate Professor of Surgery at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. This is a lecture on sports hernia, the evaluation and treatment of said disease. This is about a 15-minute lecture based on a uh, series that I am putting together called uh, Complex Hernia Issues. So let's talk about the goal with this talk about sports hernias, and that is really to go over the diagnosis of a sports hernia, what are some of the non-operative options that we have, how do we get our patient, family, and coach input on the uh, individual status and plan for these uh, patients, what are some of the operative options that we have, and what does rehabilitation look like? Well, this is a very complex problem, and it's simply because pain is the most predictive and important impactful uh, symptom associated with sports hernias. And one of the things that uh, surgeons need to be cautious about and also counsel their patients about is that when we operate for pain, especially with regards to the groin region, oftentimes pain is a result. And so we have to be very careful that we make the right diagnosis and make the correct treatment plan for us to avoid uh, further worsening of groin pain. Well, what's a sports hernia? You see this picture of this uh, trash can that has lots of different objects within it. Well, that's really what uh, a sports hernia is. It's not one single diagnosis. Rather, it's multiple diagnoses that are all lumped together. Those include true hernias, osteitis pubis, abductor longus tendonitis, hip or femur injuries, nerve entrapped syndromes, and inguinal floor weaknesses. So these are the most common diagnoses that are lumped in as called sports hernias. And they're typically called sports hernias because they happen in a more active and youth, uh, youthful population. And pain is the main diagnosis associated with it. And it's not just pain, but pain on physical activity, where repeated activity continues to elicit pain. And those activities are often um, forced to be stopped. And so patients will come with the uh, uh, pain complaint, and our job is to do our best to categorize them not as sports hernias, but by one of these diagnoses. So when we talk about true hernias, most oftentimes a, uh, a good general surgeon or hernia specialist, uh, this hernia can be uh, demonstrated on physical exam. Um, and that's something that, uh, if not, uh, an added CAT scan can be helpful as well. Inguinal floor weakness is a little uh, more difficult to truly find on physical exam. Really this is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that we've checked every other diagnosis and we feel some weakness or, or reproducible pain with coughing or sneezing or straining. And then we have a clinical suspicion based on our exam and based on the patient's symptoms. What about osteitis pubitis? This is the sports type. Here's an MRI on the side here, and the arrows point at an area of high intensity of inflammation. And that's actually happening where the rectus muscles are, the tendons are inserting into the rectus, into the uh, pubis symphysis. And so this MRI is showing an abnormality. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, osteitis pubis is an inflammatory process of the pubic bone. And as I described, the rectus muscle inserts here. So when you do a sit-up, you're actually foreshortening the rectus muscles, and you're pulling your pubis muscles toward, or pubis bone toward your rib, and that's what a uh, abdominal crunch or a, a sit-up is. And so, uh, inf inflammation where the rectus is inserting into the pubis bone is something where pain, typically right over the bone, can be palpated and reproduced with this. And this is really a tendonitis, or sometimes referred to as a tendinopathy. Um, where you have pain uh, within the tendon sheath it out, uh, itself, and sometimes it's quite recalcitrant to anti-inflammatory therapies. Sometimes an MRI will actually show microfractures, where the uh, uh, periosteum of the bone has been disrupted by uh, trauma, by repeated activities and pulling of the rectus muscle at this location. So a nice MRI that shows some of the findings that we find on an MRI uh, in a patient who has osteitis pubis. So this is quite a helpful... Uh, what about adductor longus tendonitis? 
Uh, similarly, we have an MRI here. Of the, uh, it takes a different view of the, uh, but of the uh, uh, adductor longus tendon, this muscle that inserts into the uh, into the underside of the uh, pubis bone. And this is a different location of pain. Oftentimes, patients will describe pain underneath the pubis bone, uh, and uh, it's most frequently elicited in movements that change directions. So we find this quite a bit in uh, athletes that. Uh, instead of running forwards and backwards like track athletes uh, we see this in folks that do lateral movements like soccer players basketball players and things like that it's the directional change in which the muscle is flexed and that flexion pulls uh, against the bone and that tendonitis and tendinopathy as i described with the osteitis pubis is similar but just simply in a different location so this is pain that's below the inguinal ligament region often so often on the underside of the bone and here, once again, an MRI is very helpful to uh, make our diagnosis. It's these signal changes picked up on the MRI that help us uh, take somebody who has the diagnosis of a sports hernia and now label them as having an adductor longus tendonitis. Well, it's very common also for there to be hip injuries and femur injuries uh, associated with activities. And uh, these things are, uh, are often taken for granted. An individual may say they can walk, they can jog, but when they begin to run, all of a sudden they have this pain. And uh, we should always be looking at the hip as well uh, for potential injuries such as arthritis, bursitis, uh, labral tears, uh, femoral head fractures, and even osteonecrosis. Uh, I think people remember Bo Jackson as an individual who developed osteonecrosis, eventually requiring a hip replacement. So uh, an MRI, once again, is not only helpful to look at the muscles and tendons, but also can be very helpful in evaluating the uh, hip and labral issues. What about nerve entrapment? This is a much more elusive diagnosis. It's quite hard to, uh, to sometimes put together. But I think what it also um, reminds us is how complex the pelvis area with regards to muscles in and muscles out, nerves in, nerves out. And that's why this area is difficult to not only diagnose but also to treat. But we have uh, several important nerves that come uh, from the lateral wall and come into the groin region. One of the most important ones is the ilioinguinal nerve. And it runs underneath the external oblique fibers. And uh, if there is a uh, sort of a separation of these external oblique aponeurotic fibers, the nerve can sometimes come up between the fibers and get pinched with activities. And so this has a very specific uh, region of distribution with regards to pain. And in my office, you can see here, uh, the nerve runs in the same direction as the fibers. Uh, we also have the obturator nerve uh, that comes down underneath the pelvis and actually can get trapped within the abductor longus compartment. So uh, uh, an individual who, who we think might have abductor longus uh, tendonitis may actually have a nerve entrapment there. So a normal MRI, but pain in that region may point us in that direction. Uh, it can be very helpful to do uh, some nerve testing. And this is a simple test that can be done in the office. Uh, we simply will mark out the places where an individual has pain uh, by uh, placing a plus sign there. Uh, places where they have uh, no sensation, uh, what we'll do is uh, uh, put a, uh, a, a minus sign. And places where it feels totally normal, where they have normal sensation, they'll get a zero. And so this is a gentleman who has a ilioingual nerve injury. And so you can see he has pluses all in the region. Now, he had happened to have previous hernia surgery, so slightly different scenario, but we can use the same kind of nerve topography to help us figure out uh, nerve entrapment issues. So what are some of our non-operative options we have for patients that come in with sports hernias? Uh, the most common are use of NSAIDs. So these are over-the-counter aspirin or ibuprofen or long-acting things like naproxen. These can be very helpful in reducing inflammation and controlling pain. And for many patients, uh, they can uh, return to their activities uh, after a short period of rest and, and take NSAIDs and do quite well. We can do regional corticosteroid injections. The thought here is to reduce inflammation in the area uh, by the steroid injection. And with time and rest, often uh, this helps. There are uh, long-term acting uh, neuroleptics that, such as gabapentin, precabalin, uh, that can be very helpful as well. Uh, we can do local, re local regional anesthetic nerve blocks with things like uh, bupivacaine that can help uh, dull nerves 
and oftentimes tell us uh, whether there's a nerve conduction issue. We also have neurolysis, fraying of the nerves that can be done as well. Well, what about uh, other types of non-operative uh, treatments. I'm a general surgeon and oftentimes if I'm concerned about a hip flexor or a hip joint or a, a femoral head issue, I'm going to send them to my orthopedic surgeon, my sports uh, orthopedic surgeon for a full hip and pelvic evaluation. But one of the key components of non-operative therapy is rest and that is non-impact activities. That's six weeks to six months and you tell this to a patient and their face just absolutely turns uh, to sadness because for many people the idea of this amount of time at rest with non-impact activities may mean an entire season or an end of a career for a high-level athlete and uh, so it's important to uh, communicate the importance of rest has to do with the uh, resolution of these inflammatory processes Physical therapy, well oftentimes physical therapy can begin after a period of rest. It oftentimes is a graduated uh, uh, abdominal pelvic stretching and strengthening regimen over a six to eight week period. And that's oftentimes started after the rest period has been completed. So, so those are some of the non-operative techniques that we can use to, uh, to aid in uh, improvement of symptoms. That brings us to the end of section one of Sports Hernia. Thank you.